Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The Earth is rotating faster than normal, but don't worry, you don't have to hold on for dear life. It's only of the order of like one millisecond per day, but there are people for which one millisecond per day being a difference is pretty important. Now, I've seen this news story in the press in a couple of different places, and some places said that the shortest day ever was on July 10th, and it was uh, 1.36 milliseconds faster than normal, which is unusual because the people that track the rotation of the Earth usually see the Earth's rotation being slightly slower than normal, again, on the order of milliseconds. And while one millisecond per day doesn't make a big deal, after all, there's you know 86,000 seconds in a day, if you add it up over time, that could add up to one whole second of difference. And that is why you would have to have things like leap seconds to periodically correct the clocks on the Earth with the rotation of the Earth itself. But yeah, um, the claim that you know this July t was uh, the shortest day ever, that's wrong because actually last July we had uh, July 5th, 2024. The length of day was 1.66 milliseconds slower or faster than normal. So anyway, um, as I said, th this is like a very small thing. I mean, it's, it's not even like blink and you'll miss it because, well, a blink is like 100 milliseconds. This is like very, 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 very short time. Uh, it's not like going to have a major effect on everyday life. We're not talking about environmental catastrophe because the Earth is spinning too fast. No, this is something where you have to look really hard to see the effect. And granted, depending upon what you're doing, you might actually see an effect. If you're a software developer, by the way, just think about it. What software do you run that maybe, you know, if you write server software, will it handle the clock skipping a second or adding a second? Because not all software will do that gracefully. And so that's sort of most everyday thing you might see. Uh, GPS, if you're using GPS, well, the GPS system actually has to account for this because one millisecond per day uh, adding up over time, that's like off the order of a foot, maybe half a meter every day drift, which has to get compensated for by the ground stations that periodically send updates to the satellites. But yeah, the, the people that track this, uh, one of the groups that tracks this is the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. And they're like basically trying to build the model that everybody else uses of the rotation of the Earth. And they're not just looking at the speed of the rotation. They're looking at the motion of the axis of rotation itself, right? So the axis of rotation actually moves over the surface of the Earth very slightly. It sort of processes around during a year. Uh, and I think the range of motion is typically of the order of like 10 meters, 30 feet. It's very, very small. It's like, it, it is literally a fraction of an arc second on the surface per day. And there's also a long-term drift in one direction. There's also... A diurnal variations, like literally the Earth wobbles uh, on the order of 12 hours as the tides move around the surface, redistributing mass, it causes a very, very small wobble on the order of uh, milli arc seconds, which, again, incredibly small, you know, measured in like a fraction of the width of my finger, but it's something that can be measured if you're a sufficiently nerdy science scientist. Um, it is fascinating how the Earth is affected by all these tiny forces. I should also point out, by the way, before we get off of this, the wobble of the Earth's rotational axis, this is separate from the precession of the equinoxes. So that is where, if you look at where the Earth's axis of rotation is pointing in the sky, it is it changes over time as the effects of the moon and the sun act on the Earth to twist its rotation around. And that's why over like 24,000 years, the, the first point of Aries moves through all the other point, the constellations. You know, this is why, this is what the term, the dawning of the age of Aquarius means, right? Because the first point of Aries is moving into Aquarius. Um, but that is external to the Earth, right? This is, an, the internal rotation axis is moving over the surface of the Earth. And this is all due to all sorts of tiny little forces at play. And, and also, I need to clarify that the rotation of the Earth, um, you actually, we are actually talking about the rotation of the Earth with respect to the stars, 
not with respect to the sun. We think of a day as being 24 hours, right? Midday to midday or midnight to midnight or whatever, right? But I, this is not the case we're talking about. We're talking about the sidereal day where you are measuring the rotation of the Earth with respect to the stars. Because as the Earth moves around the sun, it goes 360 degrees around the sun in a year. That means it moves just under one degree per day. That means the Earth has to actually rotate roughly one extra degree every day to do a one solar day. A sidereal day is more like 23 hours, 56 minutes. It's slightly shorter. Um, and that's what we're talking about. That's what we're referencing against. And also, throughout the Earth's orbit, like at perigee, the Earth is moving slightly faster in the winter. So therefore, it has to rotate slightly faster. So the solar days are actually slightly longer in December when the Earth is at perigee. And it's slightly longer <laughs> in the summer when the Earth is, is far... Or, yeah. yeah, slightly shorter because the Earth, the Sun is moving more slowly. Only by a very small amount. We're talking like eight seconds of difference through the entire year. But again, nerds measure this stuff and there's important reasons to do this. But anyway, one of the underlying effects that, that adjusts the rotation of the Earth uh, is the friction of the Earth and the Moon interacting. So the Moon, as you know, it creates tides over the surface of the Earth, right? The ocean rises, the tide comes in, and that's because the Moon is pulling that water towards us. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. It's really to do with the forces in a rotating system. But the effect is that we get the tides pulled out on one side because they're pulled away from the Earth. And on the other side, the side that is furthest from the Moon, since, uh, one si since the center of the Earth is closer, the Earth gets pulled away from the water, so the tides also rise on the other side. It's a nice sort of duality there. But that bulge, the tidal bulge, gets pulled around the Earth as the Earth rotates. And the Moon's orbit is going slower than the rotation of the Earth. And that has the effect of you're basically pulling a blob of water across the surface of the Earth, and it has friction associated with it. And that friction is slowing the rotation of the Earth ever so slightly. Now, what happens to the kinetic energy uh, that is being lost as the Earth slows down? Well, that bulge is uh, lagging slightly, or it's leading slightly, and it basically produces a torque on the Moon, which accelerates the Moon and pushes it up. Somebody did the math, and it is equivalent of, of transferring 3.7 terawatts of energy from the Earth to the Moon every second. And over a year, that raises the Moon's orbit by a few centimetres. And it's been doing this for a very long time. The Moon's orbit's getting higher, the orbit's getting slower, and at the same time, the Earth, its rotation is slowing down. But it turns out that if you look at this on long timescales, unless we somehow stop the loss of hydrogen into, through, into deep space, the Earth will dry out, and that strong tidal coupling will disappear and we're not going to get an Earth synchronized to the Moon. Now, the tides aren't just the only thing affecting this. You have to understand that while we are standing on what we think of as solid rock, I can assure you that being in California, it is not really solid rock. It is very much a moving, living landscape that we live on. We get earthquakes and while they're not big ones, we can feel them, we know they're happening and of course the big ones will happen at some point or another. You have to think of the crust of the earth as more or less being the solid rock floating on a much less solid subterranean you know, mantle going down through the core, the outer core which is liquid and the inner core which is then solid. The moon generates tides throughout the entire planet. There are, there are body tides which also couple from the Earth to the moon in the same way. And those forces also redistribute mass. So that then affects the rotation of the Earth because if you think about it, if you've got a rotating object and you move mass in and out, it changes the moment of inertia. And we all know this analog of the ice skater with their arms out and then spinning around and then pulling them in and suddenly they spin really fast. Well, the same happens when you take mass on the Earth and you move it up or down. It changes the rotation. And there's all sorts of stuff that moves around. We have, uh, as I said, the oceans move around. We have other hydrological effects where we have the water moving into clouds. 
getting deposited on mountaintops as snow, getting frozen up in the ice caps, getting dammed up in rivers, holding things. All of these change the angular momentum of the Earth and have changed things over time. The atmosphere, well, that's there's 10 tons of air over every square meter of the surface of the Earth, pretty much. That air gets moved around in the same way, and that will also have an effect. When storms trigger, uh, the wind blowing around will adjust, will push back against the surface and affect the rotation of the Earth. So all of these effects, generally over history, tend to lead to the coupling of the Earth to the Moon to slow the whole thing down. But right now we're in a phase where something else is driving the Earth's rotation a little bit faster. And it's quite, well, the, the lead suspect here is that there's some sort of core mantle coupling effect going on where there's perhaps a plume of material under the surface which is lighter than normal, so the plume is convecting upwards, and therefore, as this lighter material is convecting upwards, some of the heavier material is going down, and that's like pulling the arms in, the Earth is rotating slightly faster than normal, and this acceleration is overpowering the normal loss of energy due to the lunar thing. Now, the Moon is also near its uh, maximal lunacist, lunastis, which is basically the highest inclination the Moon gets, right? So over time, the Moon's inclination with respect to the Earth actually goes up and down. And if you've been looking, the Moon actually gets much higher further north and south than normal. Um, and, you know, in you know, 10 years down the line, it'll be much lower. When it's at this higher inclination, the coupling between the Moon and the Earth is much weaker so the lunar effects are lessened and therefore these other effects potentially within the Earth are able to overcome that and that's why the Earth is rotating faster than normal. So what we expect over the next couple of years is that lunar inclination will start coming down and we will see the Earth's rotation starting to slow again and we'll have to start worrying about adding leap seconds. Now usually the forces that change the rotation of the Earth happen relatively slowly over time. It's a slow variation but it's possible to identify singular events where the day length changes abruptly as a result of a big event. So there's the 2004 Sumatra earthquake and the people that study this, they observed that the day got 2.68 microseconds shorter coincident with that particular earthquake. It moved so much material around that it adjusted the rotation of the Earth on a large scale. Now, 2.68 microseconds, not a big deal over... Uh, the 20 years since that happened, that's really only changed the time of now by 20 milliseconds. There are seasonal effects that are observed throughout a year. Uh, as the weather patterns change, the distribution of water and stuff changes throughout the year, and that changes the way the, the material is distributed over the Earth. Apparently, there's a possible signal due to vegetation growth in the summer where you get more green stuff lifted up off the surface and then you know fall autumn comes and it falls back to the surface and that could actually produce a measurable change uh, you know the polar ice caps those are an obvious example because you get matter moving or water moving from one pole to another it, it, it freezes up and then it melts over time well uh, like in the long term we it's believed that when you get a warming cycle the ice caps are going to melt more. And you might think, well, that means we've got ice at the poles spreading out over the surface. So that should slow the Earth down. And that is definitely true when things warm up. And when things get cold, you get more material, more ice at the poles, and therefore it should go faster. But all that ice sitting on the surface at the poles pushes down on the surface. And that tends to squeeze the poles downwards. And that actually increases the oblateness of the Earth, which in turn slows the rotation. So these sort of the redistribution of water over the Earth in a short term can change the rotation of the Earth. But in the long term, it can change it in the opposite direction because the ice, the water, is less dense than the rock that it's pushing around. As I said, this is a fascinatingly complex subject, which has been you know, hijacked by a bunch of news stories to talk about, give some buzzwords about the days being shorter. And of course, the one thing that I get asked about all the time, what happens when we're doing a rocket test and the rocket is pointing sideways over the surface? Does that slow the Earth down or speed the Earth up? 
Well, naively, you might think it does, but what really happens is that rocket exhaust pushes against the air and the air is now pushing against the earth and ultimately the whole thing cancels out because it would be like trying to accelerate yourself by pushing against yourself. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.